A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle! And friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel. With his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. And a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wait to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're going to have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. There are those who say the richest man in England was the Earl of Crankcase. I use the past tense because one day in back of his ancestral home, Abominable Manor, the Earl decided to take a swim. I shall take a short dip and then have tea. Unfortunately, the Earl was absent-minded. Not only didn't he have any tea in the house, but he didn't have a pool. The effects of the tragedy were far-reaching. Before the week was out, the three surviving members of the Crankcase family gathered at the law firm of Lamb, Curry and Rice for the reading of the will. These were distant nephews of the late Earl, Filcher, Belcher and Jay. Oh, how we grieve our dear uncle's passing. Oh, how we'll miss him. Oh, how much did he leave us? Nothing. The entire estate consisting of a million pound note goes to the new Earl of Crankcase. And this is what he looks like. The only existing photograph was a glossy 8x10 of a 12 by 4 foot. On the sole of the foot was an inscription reading, Rue Britannia. Find a foot with that on it and I'll show you the new Earl. Wasting not a second, the nephews searched their souls. Mine says, don't tread on me. Fiddlesticks. Mine says, walk softly and carry a big stick. Oh, prunes. How do you spell Britannia? It was apparent that the heir apparent was none of them. By the end of the week, the law officers were overrun with barefoot boys with lots of cheek, all claiming to be the new Earl. It was just about then that a prominent London physician made a startling discovery. This isn't the foot of a man, it's the foot of a moose. And that brings us to Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, home of our stalwart hero, Rocket J. Squirrel. Oh, I hate my uncle, but I love my antlers. Cause antlers are a moose's best friend. Hey, Rock! Huh? What is a bullwinkle? Hand me my shower cap, will you? Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Anything I can't stand is wet horns. Say, have you seen the morning paper? It says here they're looking for a moose foot with Rue Britannia on it. You mean like this? Yeah, like that. Bullwinkle, your foot! Sure, it's my foot. I got another one just like it. They come in pairs, you know. But Bullwinkle... Sometimes they come in apples and kumquats, but mostly in pairs. Yeah, <laughs> but those words on the bottom of your foot, don't you know what that means? Yeah, I got a scrub, Hardy. No, you're the new Earl of Crankcase. Notifying the Crankcase lawyer of the big news, the boys then departed for England. Here's champion news, gentlemen. The new Earl has been located and will arrive within the hour aboard the SS Flotsam. Oh, how jolly. Here, here. By the way, sir, what would happen if the Earl were to meet with a timely accident? Why, then you chaps would split the inheritance. Flushed with incentive, the nephews dashed to the nearest beach just as a channel swim got underway. Pretending to be part of the competition, the cunning threesome dove into the water and appeared to be swimming to France. However, they had barely left shore when suddenly they veered at a 90-degree angle and set a more or less indirect course for the good ship Flotsam, which had just entered the harbor. Look out this porthole, Rock. They got the strangest-looking purposes in these waters. Those aren't purposes, Bullwinkle. What then, mermen? No, they're probably diving for pennies. Actually, they were diving for the bottom of the boat. Once there, they promptly drilled a gaping hole. Awful warm cabin we're in. Look how we're perspiring. Bullwinkle, that's 
seawater. Indeed it was, and in a matter of minutes, the cabin was almost filled. Will this turn out to be a one-episode story? Don't miss Earl and water don't mix, or next time, take the drain. In our previous encounter, we witnessed the demise of the Earl of Crankcase, who did a three-and-a-half gainer into what he thought was a pool. Naturally, this meant that a new Earl had to take his place. And this is what he looks like. He has the foot of a moose with the inscription, Rue Britannia. He not only had the foot of a moose, he was all moose and a yard wide. Bullwinkle, you're an Earl! God live it or cast you. However, just prior to closing, we learned that the three rascally nephews of the former Earl were determined to get the inheritance themselves. And as our hero's ship entered the harbor, it was met by the aforementioned trio, who promptly drilled a hole in her bottom. Bullwinkle, this ship is sinking! It sure is. What would cause an odor like that? Sinking, sinking! Oh. Indeed it was, it looked like the boys were gooners. That's gooners. Fortunately, though, the SS Flotsam settled easily into only three feet of water due to a handy sandbar. Whew. For the second day, I thought we were gooners. That's goners. Oh. Like all good luxury liners, this one, too, was equipped with an extra long gangplank, one that enabled the passengers to make it safely ashore. Now what, Rock? Now we head for the law office of Lamb, Curry, and Rice to claim the inheritance. If we can get a cab. Luck was with them and against them, for although they succeeded in getting a cab, they also got three drivers. Three drivers? That's funny. I don't know. Sounds like a pretty straight line to me. No, I mean, I think we've seen those fellows before. Yeah, probably in another episode. Are you sure we've got the new Earl? Who cares, so long as the meter's running? I know. Make him show the inscription on the bottom of his foot. Capital idea. See, other foot for inscription. Sure enough, on the other sole were the words, Rue Britannia. It's him, all right. Quick, smash the car into a brick wall and we'll be rid of him. But they were in a wall-less section of London, and so were forced to come up with another plan. Taking the first road out of town, they pulled to a stop three days later at the very brink of the White Cliffs of Dover. That's when Rocky and Bullwinkle became suspicious. Gee, you'd think we'd be at the lawyer's office by now. Relax, they're probably taking a shortcut. Maybe so, but we'd better find out. Say, fellas, why are we stopping? We're going to have the car washed. Yes, you chaps sit right where you are. This'll only take a moment. The plan was obvious. Sneaking to the rear of the cab, the three scallywags prepared to push it over the edge with our boys still inside. Ah, but a small squirrel and a large moose were quite a load. I say, chaps, push. We are pushing. But although it was perched halfway over, the cab wouldn't budge. Oh, fiddle to dee. Let's just haul them out and toss them over. And so they jumped into one side of the cab just as Rocky and Bullwinkle came out the other. Let's give them a hand, Bullwinkle. The change in weight was all it took. It's the craziest car wash I ever seen. Well, we can't fool around any longer. Let's get to the lawyer's office. And eventually they did. There's no doubt of it. Your foot and the foot in this photo are one and the same. Congratulations, you are the new Earl. Good. Can I have the million pound note now? Not just yet. You see, according to the will, you must live in the ancestral home for one week. Ancestral home? Yes, abominable manor. Shucks, I've been living in an abominable manor all my life. Yes, but not with three desperate wet nephews to contend with. Will Bullwinkle survive? We'll find out in Moose Gets the Juice or Morning Becomes Electrocuted. Let's face it, claiming an inheritance in England isn't very easy, especially if your name happens to be Bullwinkle Moose. Yes, those words Rue Britannia on the bottom of his foot entitled our moose to inherit a million-pound note. Ah, but there was a stumbling block. Three stumbling blocks named Filcher Crankcase, Belcher Crankcase, and Jay, nephews to the recently departed Earl. We must find a ruse for cooking his goose. So saying, they drove to the White Cliffs of Dover, intending to push our heroes over. What'd everybody do, get rhyming dictionaries for Christmas? Luckily, the cab was no pushover, and in the ensuing mix-up, it was the nephews who took the plunge, not Rocky and Bullwinkle. Later at the law firm of Lamb, Curry, and Rice... Is it true, Mr. Lamb? Is Bullwinkle really the new Earl? No doubt of it, my boy. That tattoo on his foot matches the one in this picture. Unfortunately, before the new Earl could collect the million-pound note, he had to spend one week inside Abominable Manor. I don't like the looks of it, Bullwinkle. Oh, clipper clabber Rock. I could live there one week standing on my head. Funny Bullwinkle should say that, for just inside the door, someone had carelessly left a Burmese tiger trap. And when Bullwinkle stepped inside, he really put his foot in it. Say, 
this place doesn't look so bad. Rocky's flying squirrel-like eyes gazed about the main hall, tastefully decorated in early Prohibition style and topped off with what appeared to be a very unusual chandelier. Bullwinkle, what are you doing up there? You heard the man. I'm a very unusual chandelier. This is no time for fooling around. Come on down. Wait a minute. I'll light up for you. And even though the rope broke, Bullwinkle kept his promise. He lit on his head. I hate episodes like this, even though I get the money later which I probably won't. Exploration of the rest of the manor eventually took them to the second floor and a sinister door. I wonder what's in there. Yeah, it's probably just a broom closet. Rocky was only half right. Actually, it was a spear gun closet. And one of them was set up so that whoever opened the door would get it right between the eyes. Like most closets, though, this one, too, had a sticky door. Forget it. I can't, Rock. It's become a kind of fetish with me. Come on, door. Open. Being as strong as a moose, Bullwinkle managed to rip the door right off its hinges. Rocky, smoke! A spear just shot over my head. Turning around, Rocky gasped at what he saw, for there, pinned to the wall, was the spear embedded in the head of a moose. Bullwinkle! It does look like me, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh. For a minute, I thought that moose head was you. Well, how do we know it is until we check? The car wash failed, the Burmese tiger trap failed. So did the spear gun. But this round, the moose will pick up the phone, I'll plug in this connection, and 11 million volts will go through him. I think somebody's out to get you, Bullwinkle. Let's phone Scotland Yard. Let's phone the police first. And Bullwinkle headed for the nearest phone, not knowing that it was connected to a diabolical switchboard in the cellar. Hello, operator. Give me the police. There he is now. Ready? Here we go. But although the connection was made, nothing happened. It's no wonder you forgot to plug this in. That's when the short circuit short circuited. Big Joe is going tonight. Operator, never mind the police. Let me speak to the governor. Would you mind getting off the phone, please? What are you going to do, Felcher? We're through playing around. The only way to get rid of the moose is to call in a professional. You mean... Yes, the exterminator. Well, it looks as though the situation is getting worse. Who or what is the exterminator? We'll find out next time in episode 120 or 123. There'll always be an England, but there may not always be a Bullwinkle. For in our last installment, he faced the bleak prospect of having to spend one week inside Abominable Manor before he could collect his inheritance. Yes, and in case you don't know, I am the new Earl of Crankcase. And Bullwinkle's gonna inherit a million pound note. A million pounds? Sounds kind of heavy. Nevertheless, that's what you're going to inherit. Inherit? I can't even lift it. Of course, Bullwinkle won't even be able to try to lift it. Not if the crankcase nephews can help it. First, they tried to do our moose in with a Burmese tiger trap. But that didn't work. Next, they attempted to shoot him with a spear gun. <laughs> that didn't work either. And finally, they sent 11 million volts of electricity through the phone on which he was conversing. That worked. Yes, but in reverse. <laughs> Realizing they were up against a much too formidable opponent, the crankcase boys decided to call on a professional assassin known as the Exterminator. Operator, get me the black hole of Calcutta, please. This is not a recording. You are talking to executive secretary to the Exterminator. Let me speak to your employer, will you? Boris, darling, you busy? Sure I'm busy. It's lunch hour. This is the way we slice the bread, slice the bread, slice the bread. What kind of cheese you want in sandwich, Natasha? Blue or Swiss? Swiss, darling. Swiss coming up. By the way, you got it business call. Business call? Goody. Things are looking down. I'll take it in mausoleum. The deal was quickly made, and it was only a matter of minutes before Boris and Natasha were on their way to England. Who are we off to kill this time? The name of the victim is unimportant. What a strange name. I agree. It was well after midnight by the time they arrived at Abominable Manor, where they were enthusiastically greeted by the nephew's crankcase. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sort of gets you right here, don't it, Natasha? And with Filcher Crankcase leading the way, Boris was escorted to a door containing a large peephole. Wictum is in here? Yes, look in there and you'll see the new Earl of Crankcase. He is your victim. That's victim. But you said, please, leave the dialect to me. But victim or victim, all Boris had to do was focus his evil eyes on Rocky and Bullwinkle and... Oh, boy, Natasha, you're never going to guess who's on other side of door. Is Peabody and Sherman? Silly girl, flying squirrel and moose. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Hey, you, you know there's two in there? Yes, the moose is the one we want you to exterminate. Okay, buddy, I tell you what I'm going to do. Going to make you package deal. 
going to kill two for the price of one. And so a few moments later, a knock was heard at the front door. That must be the police, Bullwinkle. Hey, are you the police? Right there, Governor. I'm a Bobby. Who's she? She's a Billy. Golly, officers, I'm sure glad you're here. I fear for Bullwinkle's life. <laughs> Come on, I got to put you under police protection. So saying, Boris escorted our unsuspecting heroes into a nearby closet. How come we have to stay in here? It's only safe place in house. But so you don't get lonesome, here is a radio for you to play. Hey, that's mighty thoughty. However, that was no ordinary radio, for instead of tubes, it contained sticks of TNT. Yes, and soon as it warms up, boom! <laughs> No more Rocky and his friends. Will Boris have a show of his own next week? We'll find out in Explosive Situation or Don't Make It Worse, It's Bad Enough. Well, things are reaching the boiling point down at dear old Abominable Manor. For last time, you may recall, Boris Badenov made a deadly arrangement with the crankcase nephews. It's time for a change of earl. Resourceful as ever, Boris and Natasha disguise themselves as English policemen. You may be a Bobby, but she certainly isn't. No. Show us your bobby pin, Natasha. See, darling, 20 years on force. Secure in the belief that they were under police protection, Rocky and Bullwinkle allowed themselves to be placed in a closet. Well, at least we'll be safe in here. Nothing could have been further from the truth, for Boris had given them a radio for company, a radio booby-trapped with TNT. That's bobby trap. Well, whatever it was, that radio would heat up and then... See, I bet we're just in time to catch the English sweepstakes. And the horses are coming into the home stretch with mother-in-law in the lead. Mother-in-law? I got money on that nag. Mother-in-law is still in front. They're heading for the finish line and it's... I can't take it off. It's just too exciting. That full moose turned it off. No, no, Boris. Don't go in there. And at the wire, it was Adam's apple by a neck. Boris, you're smiling? Sure, I had him to place. Well, Mr. Executioner, your first attempt was an abysmal failure. And it didn't work either. But now comes my hotsy totsy it worked on Trotsky plane. Over here we got dish of macadamia nuts. Very salty. Now, moose eats nuts. Moose gets thirsty. Moose goes to the kitchen, drinks 50 glasses water, gets bellyache. Squirrel phones drugstore for bellyache pills. Delivery boy races up driveway on motor scooter with pills. But he rolls over tech put there by yours truly and gets flat. While boy changes tire, I change pills to make it Damien nuts. Moose eats more thinking they are pills. And gets such big belly a kid needs doctor. I come in dressed as sturgeon and operate immediately. Now comes best part. Moose does not pull through. Oh, Boris, darling, you got the best twisted mind in the whole world. <laughs> I do the best I can with the tools I got. Running upstairs, Boris quickly entered the room where Rocky and Bullwinkle were sitting and anxiously awaited the right moment to put his plan into effect. Gee, I sure would like some academia nuts. This was the right moment. Oh, I mean, look, here is a whole bowl full right in my lap. Better not eat too many, Bullwinkle. They'll make you thirsty. But unable to resist, the nut-hungry moose downed them all in one fell swoop. My, I am thirsty. The evil plan was progressing perfectly. Bullwinkle went into the kitchen and promptly drank 49 glasses of water. Here, make it an even 50. Oh, thank you. Oh! Bullwinkle, what's the matter? I got a abominable, abdominable pain. Where? In my tummy. Reacting instantly, Rocky put in a call to the drugstore. Within five minutes, a delivery boy was racing up the driveway when... Just as Burris had predicted, the boy changed his tire. And I changed the pills. Sure enough, Bullwinkle swallowed the nuts, thinking they were pills. Now how do you feel? Oh, I feel much better. Oh, the doctor. And here I am. Are you a doctor? Well, you think I am an exterminator? Don't answer that. I got to operate. And before he knew what was happening, Bullwinkle found himself on an operating table while Rocky nervously paced the corridor outside. Where will it all lead? We'll learn the answer in You've Got Me in Stitches or Suit Yourself. You've got to give Boris Badenov credit. When he sets out to kill a moose, he does it like no one else. For as you no doubt will recall, he placed an innocent dish of macadamia nuts on Bullwinkle's lap. Well, what have we here? You eat those and they'll make you thirsty. Truer words were never spoken. Bullwinkle drank 49 glasses of water. And one for the road. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, that much H2O is bound to produce a tummy ache. Hello, drugstore. Send over some bellyache pills. It was all part of Boris's mad plan. The delivery boy got a flat tire, let an off, switched the pills to more macadamia nuts, and you guessed it, Bullwinkle got a bigger bellyache than ever. Hello there, Dr. Kildarevich at your disservice. I'm glad you're here, Dr. Bullwinkle Sick. You just finding out? The culmination of the evil scheme was to operate on the moose and not have him pull through. You got everything, Dr. Darling. Let me see. Paper clips, glue is all here. And with that, Boris proceeded to go to work. However, the fuse box, in abominable manner, was in an advanced state of disrepair and... Hey, what gives with lights? You want flashlight? What for? Operation is going to be failure anyway. One hour later, the exhausted surgeon emerged from the operating theater. Congratulations, squirrel. You are proud father of a dead moose. What? But you told me he'd be fine. Moose is fine. Finally dead. Pardon me, doctor. I'm sorry I was delayed. Oh, think nothing of it. Bullwinkle! Moose! Oh, there's a J in there. Bullwinkle J Moose. But the doctor said you're dead. Well, there must be some mistake, I think. You see, I heard the nurse ask for a flashlight, and so I went out in search of one. All I found, though, was this luau torch. Well, if that ain't you on the table in there, who... Congratulations, Boris. You are first doctor to ever remove appendix from suit of armor. Well, at least it's not total loss. More determined than ever, Boris pulled out all the stops. He booby-trapped the entire second floor, put poison in the drinking water, and even wrote a nasty letter. How many U's in moose? Let me see. Moose. M-U-S-E. Two. But it was all to no avail. The booby traps misfired. The poison only helped to purify the water. And the nasty letter was delivered to the wrong moose. Boys, I got proposition for you. I pay you, you kill moose. Dash it all, old man. I thought you were an expert. I am at not killing moose. You know, we really don't have to kill him. What do you mean? Well, the will clearly stipulates the moose stay inside the house for one week. You mean if Moose goes outside the house, you get million-pound note? Of course. All you have to do is lure him out, take a picture of him, and... Natasha, get my brownie. Cookie? Camera! I think I'll get some air, Rock. You better not, Bullwinkle. You're supposed to stay inside for one week. Oh, finky-foo. Oh, I think I'll go upstairs and take a nap. So saying, Rocky departed, leaving Bullwinkle alone, but not for long. Quick, only 30 seconds left to play. We got to make touchdown or we lose game. Let me make the touchdown, coach. His deal. Goal line is out through open door. Go. Don't worry, we'll win. And Bullwinkle took off, not realizing that he was heading outside the house where Natasha, dressed as a cheerleader, waited with a camera. Will Bullwinkle score but lose his inheritance? The answer lies in 50 cents lost or get that half back. Let us return to dear old Abominable Manor, where last time Boris Badenov made a startling discovery. You mean I don't got to kill Moose? Of course not. We'll still get the million-pound note if we can take a picture of him outside the house. Yes, according to the will, he must not leave Abominable Manor for one week. The week was almost up, but so was Bullwinkle's dander. I tell you, Rock, if I don't get some air, I'll go steal. Better not, Bullwinkle. With that, Rocky left to take a nap. That's when Boris came in. Boy, oh boy, he's left quarter with only two seconds left to play, and we behind six points. Never fear, Knut. I shall score us a touchdown. Good, Moose. Here, take pigskin and go over goal line. But the goal line Boris referred to was outside Abominable Manor, where Natasha waited with a camera. I take picture of Moose, suitable for framing, and job is done. Bullwinkle set sail for the open door, and it looked like the end, but only of our last episode, for the commotion downstairs had arrested the attention of our staunch hero. Stop! Bullwinkle, you're heading for the door. But the game had to be won, and Bullwinkle plummeted onward. That's when Rocky took off from the balcony and pulled a triple reverse, taking the football away, tripping Bullwinkle, who got only as far as the welcome mat, and scoring the deciding touchdown. We won! We won! Well, Boris, all I got was photo of flying squirrel. You got off easy, Natasha. I bet on other team. I got bad idea. You mean good idea. You know me, I don't got nothing good. Here is Les Ditch plan. That night, on the roof of Abominable Manor, Boris and Natasha burned the midnight oil. And when daylight finally dawned... Well, how do you like it? It's beautiful. What is it? It's rocket ship. Moose will follow Squirrel anywhere, right? It's plausible. 
So we get squirrel inside rocket, moose follows, we send rocket to moon, no more squirrel, no more moose, no more failure. Boris, you are Dracula of cartoon industry. The day passed by, as days often will do, and that evening over dinner... You know what day this is, Bullwinkle? Guy Fawkes Day? No, it's your last day inside Abominable Manor. He ain't kidding. When the clock strikes midnight, the lawyer will arrive with your million pound note. You'll be rich. Not if Boris can help it. Here is dessert, gentlemen. Nice hot soup. A butler? Where did you come from? And what's with soup for dessert? I usually get salad. Fair enough. You get salad, squirrel gets soup. But that's no ordinary soup. It contains knockout drops. Say, this is pretty good. How's your salad? Well, the tomain lettuce is a trifle wilted. I said, how about that? He's asleep. With a butler showing the way, Bullwinkle carried Rocky to the threshold of the rocket ship. That's a very odd bedroom there. Is Lady Steen. Go ahead, take Squirrel inside. And once inside, Boris quickly slammed the door. <laughs> the fools fell for it. Quick, Boris. Pull lever and blast Rocket off. It's almost midnight. Yes, the clock was just beginning to strike, and there, coming up the walk, was the crankcase lawyer. Pull lever, darling. What you waiting for? I got strange feeling something is going to happen. Something did. The rocket door suddenly opened. Sleep tight, Ross. Hey, where do you think you're going? Well, I haven't finished my salad. Now what? Now this. Will the rocket blast off? Don't miss. The scheme misfires, or you can plan it better than that. While our adventure in England is rapidly approaching a dismal climax, Bullwinkle, you'll recall, had to spend one week inside Abominable Manor or forfeit a million-pound note inheritance. But Boris got other plans. Yes, the dastardly villain built a do-it-himself rocket ship. It looks nice, but what's it for? It's for heroes. All we got to do is lure Squirrel inside. Moose follows, we slam door, send boat to moon. It looked like the plan couldn't fail. Thus, at dinner that evening... Eat your soup, Rock, or it'll get hot. Unfortunately, that soup contained an overdose of knockout drops. Two sips later... Poor Rock. He's all Tommy tuckered out. Following Boris's untimely suggestion, Bullwinkle carried Rocky upstairs into what he thought was a bedroom. But what was in reality the rocket ship? Listen, strike is clocking 12. Lawyer is due here any episode. And soon as I pull lever, Moose and Squirrel are on their way to moon. Pleasant dreams, Rock. Boris, Moose is getting out. No, he's getting in. And just as we closed, Boris prepared to launch our boys skyward. Here goes something. What gives with rocket? I don't know. It should blast off. But it couldn't. Not with Bullwinkle leaning against the brake. Moose, would you please not lean against brake? Yes, you spoiling plan. I wasn't leaning against the brake. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. He's right, Boris. What do you mean he's right? He's leaning against brake. Too darn much noise in here. With that, Bullwinkle picked up Rocky and exited the rocket. Naturally, with a brake release, the rocket took off. He was not. He was. The front door opened just as the clock struck 12. Those were the longest 12 chimes I ever heard. Ah, oh, the Earl of Crankcase. Oh, what's going on, Bullwinkle? Glad you woke up. It's the end of the story. You get the girl, I get the money. There's just one thing. I must take one more look at your foot to check the Rue Britannia inscription. Then I get the million-pound note, right? Precisely. You can imagine everyone surprised to see that the inscription was no longer there. Bullwinkle, it's gone! Well, sure it's gone. It never lasts more than a week. And Bullwinkle told them how, after he took a shower, he stepped onto his bath mat made by the Rue Britannia Bath Mat Company, Peoria, Illinois. You mean the printing came off on your foot? Yeah, cheap mats. But this means you're not the Earl of Crankies. Yes, and it also means that we get the inheritance. They did get it, and it was a million-pound note, a million-pound promissory note. Good heavens, according to this, our dear uncle borrowed one million pounds from the Bank of England. Yes, and you chaps must pay it back. What bitter irony. Filcher, Boucher, and Jay were forced to work in a local garage, draining, of all things, crankies. Cheer up, chaps. At a pound a week, we'll have it paid off in a million weeks. As for Boris and Natasha, they were last seen orbiting along the Milky Way. I tell you, Moose was not leaning on brake. You may be right. Rocky and Bowwinkle book passage on the first boat leaving for home. Boy, am I glad that's over. And you know something? 
I'd just rather be plain old me than all the earls in the world. Sure was funny how that bath mat inscription fooled us. Yeah, but what's funnier is the one on my other foot. That one never comes off. See? Oh, no! Be with us next time for further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel! Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.